everybody, this is Zach, the broker of Zach Taylor Real Estate, and I brought our chief compliance officer, Cameron. Hey, everybody. So today we're gonna to talk about the new gold rush that's happening to the real estate industry. Gold rush, you say? All these brokerages are popping up, and they're all popping up with these uh, fun words, stocks and rev share. So what exactly is stocks and rev share in the real estate community? I mean, I know a lot about stocks, but mm -hmm. kind of enlighten me as to what all of this is with this industry. Yeah, so what the idea behind it is, is that we all sell homes and we make a commission. Now the thought is, hey, I love my company, let me bring on somebody else and I recruit them so they are underneath of me. Okay. And if they sell, I get a percentage of everything they sell. Yeah. And then they can recruit people and they can recruit people. And there's all these tiers. We all get a piece of each other's commission. You know, hearing that really reminds me of the idea of, you, you watch The Office, don't you? The Office. Yeah, <laughs> The Office. So you know that scene with Dwight and Michael where Michael's explaining something and it sounds just like a pyramid scheme where, hey, you know how you make extra money? You bring somebody on. Just Don't worry about selling out. the product, just go recruit people, yeah. right? How long do you think that they can do this before it finally catches up to them? Well, there's always a capacity. There's only so many people licensed. And there's always different options that people have. They're not all gonna pick your brokerage. But what about stocks? How does that work in the real estate? Because if you look at the S&P 500, there's not that many companies publicly listed. How no. does that work? How does, a question about that is how many real estate companies are on the S&P 500? There's only a handful. I think there's only one. Yeah, on S&P 500, yes. Yeah, and there's only Berkshire. one. Oh, well, yeah, see, Berkshire Hathaway, but, but that's it, Warren Buffett's company. Yeah, though, right? he's in a bunch of different stuff. It's not just, hey, I took a brokerage on S&P 500. Right, right. There's a couple public companies. Yeah. But he's the only one that's on the S&P 500. 500. So to bring some clarification, when it, when it comes to stocks, guys, when a company gives you a stock, are they actually giving you a stock? Are they giving you a stock option? Are they giving you a debt obligation, which most of us know is a bond? So are they giving you a corporate bond? What kind of stock are they actually giving you? Because you know we've, we've seen a lot of things, we've heard a lot of things, but haven't we done some extra digging to find out like what exactly is being offered by these companies? Well, it sounds exciting because I'm a real estate agent and I'm choosing to hang my license with that company. Exactly, yeah. And I, I love seeing my company grow. Mm -hmm. So I get excited like, man, I get some stock in this company that I believe is growing and going in the mm -hmm. right direction. But what's some of the pitfalls with that? You know, a lot of times when I look at investing money in a company, because personally, I like stocks. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people don't, I do. So I wanna see the financials. What does Q3, what does Q4 of last year look like? What does the past three or four years look like? The cool thing is that every single quarter, they have to publish something on the SEC website. You know, yeah. all their financial filings, right? What do those look like? Or are you giving a portion of your money to a company without reviewing all that stuff. Well, and that's one of the problems is a lot of these companies, I, I honestly look at them as EXP 2.0. They are chasing- Let's call it what it is. This is what this one company did, and if we can replicate even a fraction of that, we're all gonna get rich. Right. But a lot of these companies are not even publicly traded. Not, yep. But hey, yep. we promise we're gonna try our best to get on the market. Right. And we're gonna give you stocks that you can't sell. So you're just kind of stuck holding this piece of paper until an indefinite amount of time? Well, that, and what is the value of that piece of paper too? Because it, it comes into, okay, how many how many available shares are there of the company, right? And then what is the valuation of that company? And mm -hmm. question, do you know who can valuate a company? So whenever you're looking at these private companies that are giving away stock, they do a 409A evaluation. With these valuations, there's no IRS guidelines. Oh. Anybody, can value your company. I could ask my mom, hey, what's my company worth? Son, it's worth $100 million. <laughs> and now I'm issuing stocks based on a $100 million valuation. Well, and you don't have to be licensed to conduct these valuations. But yet, I am saying, hey, this piece of paper, trust me, it's worth 500 bucks. Yeah. Now trade me $500. So you're telling me I could take the company's financial statements and go downstairs and find some stranger walking around outside and say, what do you think the value of this yeah. is? And we could take that valuation apply it and then go divvy out shares of the company to people? Mm -hmm. That's scary. But what we're seeing too, and this is why we wanted to make this video, is bring up some of the pitfalls with this. Yeah. We've already been discussing them, but just like this situation of it's, hey, this share is worth $500, but what they're doing is they're saying, well, give me just $400 of your real money and I'll give you 500 of a share. Here you go. Ah, so it's okay. a discount gotcha. to get in early. So how do I get that money back out though? Don't I have to sell it back to the company? Potentially. Well, what if the company doesn't have the money to give me? Yeah, liquidity issue. Guys, there's so many different pitfalls that you can take with, with any of this. It is you are changing real money for something that may or may not happen. Yeah. You don't know. And not only that, let's look at the history of what happens to these companies when they do go live. And it's not just real estate companies, it's 
any company, and, and I shouldn't say any, but I would say about 99.9% .9 of them, when they go live on the stock market, what happens? Yeah. You open yourself up to a lot of different issues. Well, we, we get our heads in the cloud because it's like, hey, we can all get rich, or we, own, we all know that one person that actually made it. Yeah. But the problem is we're talking about the 1% of the scenario. Mm -hmm. And we're extrapolating that to the 99% of agents that will not experience that same sort of success. Oh, and not just that, to add to that, is that what is it really gonna look like when they go to exit this? Like, yeah. how do you get your money back? Because we all know, like, don't agents typically switch brokerages too? They do. They do, so if they leave and they have stocks vested, do they get that money back? Uh, if they're not vested, no. Oh. So that's something to look at too. Are you a part of a company that's making all these promises? You're getting these shares and the share price is very volatile. You're you're having closings when it's at, let's say $20 a share, but you're wanting to get your money out when it's $10 a share. Guys, there's so many pitfalls to this, right? But you, even you, you were touching on investing periods. Yeah. Most companies always land on that three year mark. I wonder why. <laughs> they know that statistically 90% of agents leave the business in three years. And so they say, you have to stay with our company for three years or else you get none of it. You get no rev share, no stocks, it's all gone. And it's this mm. continuous hamster wheel. Yeah. That, hey, I just had a closing, maybe I wanted to get some stock with this company. There's a three year unlock from that period. Yeah. Then you have a closing six months from now. Well, it's three years from that point. Yep. So you just always are trapped in this, well, I have to unlock, I have to unlock. Because if you leave, it's all gone. How many of these startups actually make it? You know, I was actually shocked when I looked this up, but Harvard Law School says 75% of startups fail. And uh, there's other websites that say it's as high as 90% fail. So it's very similar to the failure rate inside real estate too. It's usually 90% within that three year period. So you're, you're trading real money with a company that has a 90% chance of failing. Of never making it on the stock market. Plus you're taking that 90% with your 90% of not making it three years with that company. You may still be in real estate, but things change. Agents change brokerages all the time. So, so you're really, stacking the odds against you. So we'll just call it how we see it. So it's really, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you will never get that money back then. There's is what lot. it really looks like. Okay, so now knowing that, it's is it really worth giving up a chunk of your commission to give to somebody else to manage it? Or is it worth keeping all of your money and just sticking it in an index fund, just the good old yeah. Dave Ramsey style? Well, and, and that's, that's the thing we're trying to uh, make agents think about more clearly is, yeah. hey, you're paying these large broker splits. You're paying a cap of $15,000, $20,000 in the hopes of getting a fraction back. And that's a small cap too. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you could just be at a flat fee brokerage or 100% brokerage, make all your money and go do what you want. Don't yeah. put all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Go put it, like you said, in an index fund, which tracks all the 500 biggest companies. Right. That's Not just looking one. at consumer goods. They actually have tangibles that if something happens, Hey, they've got things they can sell because in the reality is we run a real estate company. We know what it is. How many real estate companies actually have tangibles if something happens and they le need liquidity? Yeah. What do they have that they can sell? Yeah. Because you can't just start selling people, right? <laughs> well, and, and you're putting all your eggs in this basket and you've never met the founder. You've never seen a profit loss statement. You've never seen the balance sheet for yeah. that company. You've never seen any of these things and you're like, sure. I'll put my hands in this person's future. There's just too many pitfalls to it. And mm -hmm. there's actually an article we're looking at right here on, yeah. on your laptop written by, uh, I believe his name's John Taylor with the FTC on how dangerous these things are. So this is uh, by John Taylor with a PhD and also in Consumer Awareness Institute. And he wrote this article on MLMs and he said, quote, the failure and loss rates for MLMs are not comparable with legitimate small businesses, which have been found to be profitable for 39% over the lifetime of the business. Whereas less than 1% of MLM participants profit. MLM makes even gambling look like a safe pet in comparison. Oh, that's scary. So it says that 1% benefit and profit off an MLM. Mm -hmm. Who's that 1% that's benefiting? The owners, the people at the top. And, and there's a reason because they they need the money. Yeah. So they're like, hey, we'll give you stock. We'll give you shares because they're cash strapped. They're in debt or they're trying to exit. They need money somehow. And they're like, hey, pay your monthlies up front for a whole year. I'll give you a discount. Oh, hey, yeah. buy this share for me and I'll give you a discount. They're just trying to get your real money for their promises. It, it goes back to the good old saying, robbing Peter to pay Paul. What mm -hmm. happens when you go to Paul and Peter and both their pockets are empty? What are you gonna do? And that goes back to what he just said, 99% of them blow up. And he, said, he ended this paragraph saying, MLM as a business model is the epitome of an unfair or deceptive acts or practice. 
that the FTC has pledged to protect against. It is even worse than classic no product pyramid schemes for which the loss rate is only about 90% and pay to play chain letters. For promoters to present MLM as a business opportunity or income opportunity is a misrepresentation. There's a very, very, very scary chance that a lot of these companies that are building out and everything, there's more likely than not, it's not gonna work out in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that's why our whole business model is geared around give agents their money. Exactly. Get them to 100% commission. Mm -hmm. Don't have broker splits. Don't have the promises of stocks and rev share. Give them all their money allow them to go do whatever they want with it, with no rules. And they don't have to worry about liquidity issues with us because we don't have to pay them out thousands of dollars every single month yeah. to just recruit more people and just recruit more people. That's the framework that we should all be looking at as well, is yeah. it, it shouldn't be about the gold rush. None of us got into real estate to just go recruit a bunch of agents. No. We all got in to help people buy or sell, to yeah. accomplish those goals and dreams of home ownership. Yeah. It's not about, let me go recruit all my friends, even though I know deep down this brokerage is not really doing the best, it's yeah. not really helping me, but you know what, I could get a cut of their stuff. Yeah, and we both know that recruiting is just like selling houses, so you're gonna expend time and energy to recruit agents, and mm -hmm. what's the likelihood that they're gonna sell something to make you money? Yeah. That's and another thing to look at too, guys, is what's the likelihood of the person you recruit that's actually gonna turn around and sell to make you a sustainable income? And you recruit 10 people in three years, you're only gonna have one under your MLM shape. Oh, sweet, so you're gonna have to just constantly recruit which is taking your, your main focus off of why you got into the business, of helping people buy or And sell. I think both you and I can share from experience, if you expend your time and energy selling homes instead of recruiting agents, wouldn't you make a lot more money? Oh yeah? Yeah. Guys, think about it like this, you go recruit 40 agents, you might make 30 grand in residuals, maybe 40 or 50 if you're lucky and you got some really heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. You know, like this, you go sell 40 homes, Make a lot more money. That's several hundreds of thousands oh, yeah. of dollars. There's a huge discrepancy there. So remember again, like what Zach said a minute ago, is why did you get into real estate? Was it to recruit people or was it to sell houses? I got into real estate to sell houses and not recruit people. I don't know about you. Same. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. So if you guys have any questions, any comments, comment down below. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and we'll see you next time.